Welcome to Victory Christian Center. You're about to hear from guest minister, Pastor Robin McFarlane, as she brings us a message on a Sunday service. It's an honor to be here, it really is. I've known the pastors um, years and years and years. Uh, since this church started, we've known them, my husband and I did, and we worked qu quite close with them in the early days. And uh, of course, with ICFM, that's kept us very close as well. So I don't take it lightly being here to speak to each and every one of you. It is an honour and it's a privilege to bring the Word of God to um, my brothers and sisters in this house. So uh, my message is, oh, oh, Word of Faith. It is Word of Faith and, and it's um, Breakthrough Prayer or I didn't really know, I thought Triumphant Prayer no, not prayer, I'm sorry, faith. It's about faith. So triumphant faith, faith is good. You can't survive without it, that's for sure. And really, we are the most powerful people on the earth. We really are. You know, Christ in us, the hope of glory, he's, he's all powerful. And, uh, but we are the most powerful people, but many Christians don't really realise this. And, uh, but we've made, been made the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. We've been given all power over all the power of the enemy. And nothing by any means shall hurt us. So we need to live in the truth of God's word. Grab it and, and run with it. And that's what's so great about the word of faith. That it's, it was a life-changing life thing. When we caught hold of this message, uh, it was 19... 81, I think we caught hold of this message. Oh my gosh, we didn't know what had hit us. We just thought, this is a, amazing. And uh, it was and definitely life-changing. And it saved my life. It saved Don's life for many, many years. He could have been long gone before he did pass on to heaven. Anyway, I'm going to share a few things of things that I have been through. And um, and I hope it encourages you. I just want to encourage you in your faith today, and you know, just to know God has got His hand on your life, and He's He's there for you all the time. It says in two Corinthians two fourteen. Now thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph in Christ. He always will lead us in triumph. God's plan is for us to live triumphant lives over all the challenges that we face. And we all face challenges, isn't that right? Yeah. So this world has been lying under a blanket of darkness, of great deception and evil for a long time. You know about that, I'm sure. And Pastor Stephen would have talked about that. But over the past six and seven years, uh, God has been exposing the depth of wickedness and darkness on the earth, which is great because we're coming into a, a Days of greatness, of God's power and God's glory upon the earth. It says in Isaiah 60 verse 2, For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, and deep darkness the people. So that's what we've awakened up to. But we're on, to, on the cusp of something huge. It says in Isaiah 60 verse 2, But the Lord will arise over you, and his glory will be seen upon you. The Gentiles shall come to your light, so your light and the kings to the brightness of your rising. So this is going to be a powerful time. We're moving into these days right now with the light and the glory of God is going to hit us. And the body of Christ here on the earth um, is to influence not only our friends and our workmates, but to influence the nations and the nation of this, this nation to bring about the change that God has spoken of in his word. And to do this, we need to be fearless. You need to have fearless faith coupled with bold prayers and declarations. And we cannot fail. God is depending upon each and every one of us. Never think you're just too small or insignificant. In God's eyes, each and every one of you is significant. And each and every one of you has a call and a job to do on this earth. So... Many um, of us, are, we're well aware of the, the evil and so forth. And uh, this earth has been suffering. New Zealand has been suffering. Absolutely. And uh, it's with 
because of the control of ungodly people in positions of authority and influence for decades and even centuries. So we're not only talking about governments, but of media, judicial system, education. What they're trying to teach the children today is horrific. Horrific. Uh, the medical profession even hasn't been able to be trusted totally. So many of these systems have been under the control of influence and influence of evil agendas and of wicked people. And it says in 1 John 5.19, the whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one. So it was not an accident when God raised up the what we know as the faith movement in the 60s. I think it sort of started trickling along in the 60s, 70s, 80s. Uh, it was never just for the meeting of our personal needs, although that was important to God, and our personal needs of our family. That is important. But it was also for such a time as this. And uh, the you know, the body of Christ should have got a hold of this faith message long ago. And I'm surprised how many churches don't even touch upon this, which is very sad. So it does leave it up to us, guys. <laughs> it leaves it up to those who, who know how to walk by faith and know how to change things by faith. And all of you are capable of doing this. And that's why you know, it says we live by faith day by day. It says in Habakkuk 2 verse 4, the just shall live by faith. And 1 John 4 4 says, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. And in, uh, it says in 1 John 5 4, for whatever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. So we need to understand about faith. We need to live by faith, walk by faith, talk by faith. By faith we stand and by faith we run. Isn't that right? We run the race that is set before us. But this is not all just for our own personal needs, our family needs. Our race involves bringing life, freedom and justice into the nations. It is standing in faith against the darkness and the wickedness that has been controlling the world. So to walk by faith is to walk with God, to cling to him, to lean on him, to draw from his word. You know, you need to be hungry for the word of God. I mean, Don and I, when we first caught hold of this message, man, that, our Bibles went everywhere with us. And I have to say, a Bible app is not as good <laughs> as a paper Bible. There's something about holding a Bible, and it's all marked up, you know, and you know where to go, whereas on a on the, you know, on your phone app or whatever, you think, well, where's that scripture? I can't find it. But you turn to your Bible, it's just sitting there. So, you know, we're to, as I say, walk by faith and draw from his word. And in him, in Christ, we find all our resources, all of them. It is knowing God as our only source in all our difficulties and all our trials. It says in James 4, 6, Therefore, submit to God, Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. He comes to kill, steal, and destroy. And, you know, sometimes things happen and we forget, hey, who's doing this? What's behind this? It's Satan. And we need to submit to God and resist, stand against the enemy, and he will flee from you. He's scared. When you get the word of God in your mouth and you're starting speaking it at him, he hates it. It cuts him. It, it, it hurts him. So we've got to stand against his attacks by faith, whether it's sickness, fear, oppression, depression, lack, or attack on our loved ones. We need to stand against his attacks by faith. And such is the life of faith. We look to God as our healer, our deliverer, our provider, our peace, our joy, our hope. He's our everything. And as I said, the life of faith is not just for ourselves and family, but for mankind and for the nations. God will never fail anyone who has a trusting heart. But first we must know him inti intimately so that we can absolutely trust God to honour our faith and prayers. Hebrews 11.1, 1, a great faith scripture. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. You could say, now faith 
gives substance to the things you hope for. It brings the evidence of things not yet seen. That's what faith's all about. Firstly, though, you need hope. If you haven't got hope, faith's not going to work. You know, otherwise, faith's got nothing to hang on. And you know the story of Abraham when God said, I'm going to make you a father of many nations. And then he took him outside and showed him all the stars of the heaven. And that was hope. He was putting a picture of hope there. And now Abraham had something to pin his faith on. So some, we need an image of the answer. If you're waiting for something, build an image of the answer. See it. That's your hope. And then your faith is going to grab that. The Bible tells us, don't look at the circumstances with the natural eye, but to see things through the eyes of faith. Faith brings what we have pinned our hopes on, as I said, into this natural realm. So many of us have faced, and may be facing right now, the storms of life. You know, pastors don't escape those. We, we've had our storms in life. But we always have to look to Jesus. We look to his word. And this is what he's saying. He, this is something he said to me once. He says, keep your eyes on my word. Don't look at the circumstances. Don't listen to the naysayers. Don't listen to the doubts. And most of all, do not fear. Do not lose hope. But stay in faith. With God, all things are possible. With God, all things are possible. We cannot find faith using the left side of the brain. Some people are left side, you know, left brain minded. They're the more the they're the black and white people. And uh, you know, that's our side of our intellect and the logical side. So we use the right side of our brain to process faith. It's the creative side of our brain. You know, one of the biggest battles that of faith that Don and I faced was when our eldest daughter, who was 18 at the time, some of you may have heard this story, I don't know, but it's good to hear. <laughs> anyway, she was, uh, we were down in Christchurch actually, and we were flying home at this particular time. She was, she was on a, her and a friend went horse riding. She used to ha own her own horse, and she, she just hired a horse for a, or it was, a, it was the next racehorse, which we didn't even sort of think about. But anyway, she got, she, they were riding on the farm and um, suddenly this horse went berserk. I don't know if something frightened it. It took off, galloping and bucking at the same time and she was thrown violently from the horse and crashed on the ground. And in doing so, one side of her liver was crushed and her portal vein, the main portal vein from the liver was severed. And she was rushed to hospital and we just got a call when we arrived at the airport to say go immediately to the hospital. And anyway, she was taken into theatre and we were to wait down in the intensive care unit. And Don and I, of course, we were immediately putting a demand on the covenant. We were declaring things. We fought in prayer for several hours and declaring what God had promised concerning that you, know, you shall see your descendants, descendants, and so forth. You need to have the word in your heart because times like that, you haven't got time to quickly look through your Bible. It's got to be coming out your mouth. And so we were fighting in prayer for several hours. And then we got a call the, the, um, from the intensive case would you please go up to the uh, theatre because the surgeon wanted to talk to us. And so we were put in, taken into this theatre next to the other one, which was not being used at the time, of course. And uh, we were sitting there and he came in all garbed up and sat down and he he's explained what had happened, you know, what it, with her liver and how they'd already been pour, putting blood in Eight times, you know, each time it would be going out. Eight times they had to replace her blood. And, and he was telling us that she was going to die. He said her, where the portal vein is severed, it was below the bloodline and there was no way he could stitch it or whatever. Anyway, Don's response was, we don't receive that and you go and do the best you can. Anyway, when he said we don't receive that, the the surgeon just looked at him and he says, I don't either. <laughs> it was just like God had just hit him. I don't either. 
And he went back in there and we went back down into the intensive care waiting room and we were going for it. We were interceding. We were declaring the word. You know, I was saying, Lord, you promised to give Lisa the desires of her heart and one of her desires was to be married and if she dies now, she's not married. And, you know, and I was putting the word in. Father, you said we will see our, dis- our children's children. If she dies now, she won't even have any children. And so it was, it was reminding God of his word and his promises. And we were just fighting and reminding God of his promises for us. And then uh, the um, sister court of the, or the head charge nurse of the intensive care came out to us and said, it's a miracle, it's a miracle. They're bringing her down into intensive care. They had stopped, he had somehow, he was able to stitch that, you know, the portal vein and uh, they just sort of, just left her all packed up and, and to later on uh, do further surgery a few days ago. But, <clears throat> you know, if we didn't have the word of faith, she wouldn't be here. We wouldn't have known how to, to stand on the word of faith, to, to remind God of his word, what he had promised. And, you know, we say, Lord, you promised this, so we expect this to happen. So, if, you know, if, I hope none of you have to face something like that, but you, you should always be ready. We never know. We just, sometimes we, we never know. And so... Um, it's just so, it's so, so important. You know, he said, with long life I will satisfy you and show you your salvation. I said, 18 years, Lord, is not long life. You know, and so it's just reminding God of his word. He doesn't mind. He, he, he appreciates that. And so we had a miracle there. Our daughter, well, she's taken over, the, her and her husband taken over the church. She has two lovely daughters and uh, two granddaughters. So... That's great, isn't it? So I'm seeing my descendants' descendants. So God honoured that word. <coughs> yeah, that's a, gra- that's a great thing. But faith is not just for emergencies. It's for everyday life. It really is. It says in Mark 11, 22, 23, Have faith in God. For assuredly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that those things he says will be done, he will have whatever he says. Jesus didn't finish by saying you shall have whatever you believe. He says you'll have whatever you say. And that is so important. You you can believe in your heart, but if you're speaking opposite to what you're believing in your heart, you'll never receive. What are you saying? Think about it. And you say, yeah, God, I'm believing for that. Oh, and the next minute you're taking it away. You're speaking the opposite to it. So you, remember, you'll never res- receive what you're believing for if you're not speaking in line with what you're believing. It says in Proverbs 18 and verse 21, death and life are in the power of the tongue. You know, probably it's the most important instrument, if you like, of your member of our body is our tongue. You know, we, we, we cut ourselves out of a lot of things by the things that we say. You need to hear what you say. It says, death and life are in the power of the tongue, Proverbs 18.21. Death and life. So who we choose. God doesn't force us to just speak life, but how many times do you speak death? You know, oh, I'm getting old. You know, I tell people... I don't believe in old age. I don't believe in it. And uh, I just say, no, I'm getting younger. Lord, I'm getting younger every day. I refuse to grow old. <laughs> I'm not going to grow old gracefully, okay? So, so, so death and life are in the power of our tongue, all right? And, uh, you know, here's a, another story. When I was in my early 30s, married without my three children, my youngest was five at the time. I woke, I woke up one morning and I was hit uh, with arthritis, just bang. Every joint in my body was so, was pain, so painful. You know, I could barely walk. Uh, everything was agony, but I, I didn't agree with it at all. I wouldn't agree with it. And uh, not for one moment. I never told anybody. I may have mentioned to Don I was, I was, you know, what was happening, but I don't even know if I did. At first I was just, you know, I, I don't agree with it. I refused to agree with it. And uh, 
You know, I don't need to declare, you know, by Jesus' stripes I have been healed. Jesus bore all my sickness. He carried all my pain. And with his stripes, I am healed. And I, I'd use um, scriptures like Psalm 103. Bless the Lord, I my soul. And I forget not all your benefits. You forgive all my iniquities. You heal all my diseases. You, this is what we need to do. Know that you redeem my life from destruction. You crown me with loving kindness and tender mercies. You satisfy my, my mouth with good things so that my youth is renewed like the eagles. Do, have I ruined that? Is that okay? Hope. Okay. <laughs> okay. So I agreed with the word too. It says that destruction and famine, I shall laugh. And I remember... Uh, Going, ha, 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 Satan, you can't, you know, I'm laughing at you, you're a, you're a failure, you're not keeping this on me. And I, I would just make myself laugh. And also, you know, claim that I'm by, he, Jesus bore all my sicknesses. He carried my pains. I don't need this thing. So I, I used every spiritual weapon that I knew, and, and um, including, including I asked, one evening we had a little prayer meeting, just, we had... Myself and Don and two other believers, we would meet every week and be praying. And anyway, at the end of it, I said, oh, could you please just pray pray for me? I don't even know if I said what the issue was. But anyway, after that, one week later, one week after it first hit me, I woke up <coughs> and all pain and stiffness had gone. And I heard God say, your trial is over. And... Who was testing me? It wasn't God. It was Satan. It says Satan comes to sift us like wheat. And he does. So we have to say what we want. Believe in your heart and confess with your mouth. You shall be saved. You shall be healed. You shall be delivered. You cannot separate your words from your faith. Our words pinpoint where our faith is. You should ask, if you're not going to be honest with yourself, ask your husband or ask your wife or ask a friend, do I speak positively or not? <laughs> They'll be more honest than maybe sometimes we are. So, remember that little lady in Mark 11, Mark 5, 25? And she had been bleeding for 12 years. That's, that's tough. She would have been... Really weak, frail, fragile. I would say she'd be absolutely fragile. But she heard about Jesus healing people, and she put her faith and she put her trust into Jesus, in Jesus, even though she had never seen him or heard him speak. But she heard about it, and she she grabbed that. And you know, this little lady could have said, "There's no point in my going to Jesus. I could never push through the crowds because there's always crowds following him, or he may not heal me." But instead, she said in verse 28, she says, If I may touch the hem of his garment, I shall be made well. And that was her moment of victory. She spoke out her healing. I shall be made well. That was her declaration of faith. So we should never talk about our problems, our failures, how we never could be healed. We never have enough money to pay the bills. You have what you say. Change what you say. I mean, I used to, I found myself doing that. Oh, we never have enough. And then it just, I got pulled up. And I changed what I said about that. Um, your children might say, oh, my children are caught up with drugs. It's hopeless. I'll never get a job or whatever. Don't say those things. I'll never get a raise. I remember um, my granddaughter, when she was a teenager, she got in with a bad group and... Um, Went through a bit of trauma and she ended up on drugs, bad drugs. And I was, and she'd always be, I'd be the one she would call, ring. <laughs> she'd always be ringing me. And I, you know, I would, I was on my knees often for her life and I would intercede and I'd be praying for her freedom to get away, to get out of those drugs. And, um, and it would look like she's getting, breaking, making a breakthrough, then she'd fail again. And one night she rang me again and she was in a bad way um, probably suicidal and that and anyway I felt I got off and fell to my knees and I said God I ask for her life and God said you've got it just like that 
And I just got up and said, I'm not going to worry anymore. If I heard anything, Father, you said, I've got it. I've got her life. I mean, she's now got a degree. She's got two, cho- two children. She's got a high-powered job. She's serving in the church. She's, she's great. Honestly, she is. She's a, she's a hilarious person. <laughs> She's so straight up, you know. She's right in in your face. She's straight up. You you don't muck around with her. (laughs) Uh, She's she's a bit of a character. Um, And I'll tell you another. I hope this will help you. These sometimes you hear about how other people fight these things. It does help. But back back in the um, eighties, I came down with a terrible strain of flu, and I ended up with pneumonia. And I made a vow before heaven. And so I got through that, but I, I, when I got over that, I said, I made a vow before heaven, I will never get the flu again. And I never have since. That's since the 80s. I've never had the flu. When flu time comes, I don't rush out for a flu shot. I take out communion. And I say, this is my flu shot. I'm taking this. And I'm not going to get the flu. And I'll take you know, the blood of Jesus and the bread, the body of Jesus Christ. That's my healing because he bore my sicknesses and carried my pains. So why should I carry the flu? Why? <laughs> Silly, isn't it? You know, we have all this done for us and sometimes we, we forget. But God wants, hey, he wants us well. He wants us strong. He wants you to prosper. He wants you to be successful in life and uh, happy too. He wants you know us to, to be able to laugh at destruction of fat men. We laugh, ha ha ha. You know, <laughs> that's what I do with the devil. Ha ha ha, devil. No, you're not getting me. You know, just laugh in his face. I tell you what, he'll be gone in a shot. He doesn't like it. So, so we need to apply the same faith to the nations. In this nation, and, and I know we have been. It's, I know your church has been. Our church has been. And uh, things are going to get better. Jesus did say, he said, oh, the word says in Psalm 2, he said, Ask of me and I will give you the nations for your inheritance and the ends of the earth for your possession. So Jesus asked way long ago, he's, he's asked for the nations and he's asked to, for possession of New Zealand. And I say to God, as a joint heir with Jesus Christ, I've asked for New Zealand as a joint heir, I'm, I take possession of this nation and say, Jesus, come take possession of our nation. You know, when we pray, believe that God is hearing and we declare that New Zealand is Jesus' possession. This is his country. Nobody else's. It's been promised to him and it's been promised to the body of Christ and I believe we're going to have just an amazing move of the Spirit of God across this nation. And there once was a prophecy that went out, and I don't know who said it, but they said that this nation will be saved, even all of it. So that's a good thing to hold on to, isn't it? That was years ago, and I don't even remember who said it, but I thought, wow, I like that word. I grab it for this nation. You know, and like you were saying, God's own. That, that word, they don't say it. It's hardly heard of today. But when in the 80s, it was God's own. It always was God's own country. And until finally, you know, I think government people crept in, perhaps news media, and that no longer became a word, a statement in New Zealand. But we need to say it again, guys. This is God's own. This is his own country. This is his right to possess this. So... Going back, I'm nearly finished, but going back to that little lady with the issue of blood, she acted on her faith um, declaration, for she said, if I may touch his clothes, I shall be made whole. And in her sick and very, very weak state, she pushed through that crowd, touched his garment, and was immediately made whole. Sometimes we just have to push through until we have the victory. Don't quit because you don't get the answer in the, in the first week, second week, third week, maybe in the first year. You push on. You hold on. Do not let go. Keep reminding God of his word, whatever it was. You know, when I was struck with um, arthritis that, day, that time, every day I would get up. I would do what was needed. I had three children. And the youngest, as I said, was five. And I just carried on as if I was normal, even though it was agony. But, you know, I never didn't believe that 
I would be perfectly healed. So faith always involves believing and speaking and acting like it is so. They all go hand in hand. Believe what you are saying and you'll have what you say. Then act on what you are saying. That's God's will for you and for me. He is preparing us for these days of his great glory where our faith is so well developed and fine-tuned so he can use us to demonstrate his kingdom in the earth. Faith may seem insignificant. It's likened to an insignificant mustard seed. So tiny it would blow away in a gentle breeze, yet it grows to be the biggest tree of all the herbs. Satan will try and blow away your smallest bit of seed, your small seed of faith that you have released by intensifying the situation. He's trying to blow away that seed of faith. But who would think that within that tiny little seed of faith is the potential to produce a great victory? Hold on to your faith. Don't ever, ever let go of faith filled words. Amen. So how about we just do a declaration together? Would you like to do that? So we want to stand up? So I'll, I'll lead you in this declaration. Okay. Father God, I make a quality decision today before heaven and earth to walk by faith and not by sight. I choose to walk in love, for faith works through love. I refuse to fear. I refuse to doubt. I will hide your words in my heart and declare your word in the face of fear, doubt and unbelief. I am a faith-filled child of the living God. Nothing shall by any means hurt me. Thanks be to God who always gives me the victory through the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Thanks for watching Victory Christian Centre. For more content, please subscribe to our YouTube channel or you can subscribe to our podcasts on Spotify, iTunes or Google Podcasts. Check out our website at victory.net.nz. We'll see you again soon.